Good morning. Um, the title of the talk today of my talk is Effects of Density on Batrachochytrium Dendrobotitis Transmission in Mountain Yellow-Legged Frogs. And um, this is work that I did with Sherry Briggs, who was my advisor I just uh, finished last year at the University of California. And now I'm working at Yosemite as the aquatic ecologist, continuing some of my work there with mountain yellow-legged frogs. Next slide. So I'm going to be talking about infectious disease. This is um, the amphibian chytrid fungus, which uh, Gary just mentioned, and most of you have probably become familiar with. So infectious diseases, there's been a lot more information lately in the literature and examples of wildlife and uh, how they're impacted by infectious diseases. And oftentimes what we're seeing is that infectious diseases can be drivers of dynamics, population dynamics, and also threats to population abundance. However, both in the literature and also as predicted by our best ecological theory, host extinction is a very unlikely outcome. And that's because for most, um, in most cases with a lot of the models that we use, there is a, some sort of a threshold where if the host abundance becomes so low, then there's no more host for the disease agent to continue to reproduce and the disease will die out. So um, there are very few cases in the literature, I've done a n numerous literature searches of an extinction of a species that's been implicated as uh, through an infect by an infectious disease. So uh, what I do find is a few possible mechanisms of disease-induced ex extinction when you go kind of one step beyond the basic ecological theory. For example, if you have a disease with a reservoir species, whether it's a biotic or an abiotic, then the threshold um, of the focal host species doesn't really hold anymore because the disease agent is able to reproduce in the environment. Also, diseases can predispose populations to stochastic events, and then we have problems with small populations, and so diseases have been implicated in those extinctions as well. And the third case, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, are diseases with non-density dependent transmission. So up above when I say our basic ecological theory, we use density dependent transmission for the most time, and I think more and more we're finding out that maybe not all diseases are acting um, in that way. Okay, next slide. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with a grant that um, has been happening at UC Berkeley for the last five years called Amphibian Disease Dynamics in a Fragmented Landscape. Sherry Briggs is the PI of that grant, and I was um, a graduate student working on that. And the goal of that grant was to understand and predict the effect of a fungal disease on Ron Muscosa populations. And I highlighted predict, um, and that's something that I'm going to be talking about today, that you're going to be seeing a lot more mathematical models and predictive models that come out of our work. And that's, in fact, one of the main goals is to come up with a very spatially explicit, individual-based mathematical model that's going to predict the effect of different management op uh, actions and different scenarios uh, that that we see based on all of our work that we've done in the past five years to um, parameterize these models. And so one of the main things that we need to know if we're going to be able to predict is what kind of transmission is happening and what, what the form of this transmission is. Okay, next slide. All right, I'm going to try not to show too much math today, but um, unfortunately this is a mathematical topic. So. Most of the disease models that you may have seen divide up the population into susceptible individuals and infected individuals, and individuals go from the susceptible box to the infected box via transmission. And the transmission rate is made up of two components, the rate of contact between susceptibles and infected, and the probability of infection once there is contact. So our null model that we've been using for a number of decades is the density dependent or the mass action transmission. Um, and this beta here is this transmission rate. This density dependent transmission is, says the rate of contact increases linearly as the density of infected increases. And this is kind of what you expect the more infected individuals you put in, it's kind of a proportional increase in the transmission rate. 
here in this case this is what i was talking about before host extinction is very unlikely because of this threshold that evolves out of the mathematics of the model here is something an alternative that's becoming very popular is a few professors at berkeley wayne gets if you're familiar with him he's been talking about frequency dependent transmission and actually thinks that it should be the null model instead of mass action and that in fact most systems are acting like this so there's a lot of papers coming out talking about this as the you know effect of infectious diseases and wildlife becomes more and more well known so here individuals come in contact with other individuals at a fixed rate and transmission depends on the fraction of contacts that are with infected individuals. So this is kind of assuming that an individual is only going to interact with really the fixed number of individuals in the local environment, um, and it depends what fraction of those. The classic example of, de of frequency dependent is a sexually transmitted disease, where you would, uh, over a given time period, you can assume that an individual has a fixed number of sexual interactions and sexual partners, and what really matters is what fraction of those are infected. Um, and in this case, host extinction is possible, and it reduces mathematically. I'm not going to show you the details. But this is a case where um, we may be seeing extinctions. And there's other functions that we're investigating as well, um, and I've listed those down here. OK, next slide. So I'm going to talk about some experiments that I did and uh, I worked with Sherry on to basically elucidate which transmission function is happening in this system. And the system is the mountain yellow-legged frog and the amphibian chytrid fungus, Betrachochytrum dendrobotitis. Most of you are familiar with the life cycle. In the early summer, the uh, Ron Wiscosa eggs are laid. They last for about two weeks. There is no keratin present in these eggs. Keratin is what the chytrid zoospores uh, infect. And then we have the tadpoles that usually overwinter a couple years, last two to th three years, and then metamorphose. And um, both subadults and adults are impacted by, by the zoospores. Um, and we see most of the mortality in Ronomuscosa, at least experimentally, um, from the tadpole to the subadult stage. OK, next slide. So I'm asking, what type of transmission characterizes Ronomuscosa tadpoles? So here. Um, here you can see a case where there's just a few tadpoles, so you would assume um, that the individuals aren't going to be coming in contact with as many infected, any individual. We're here in a very dense environment. You would assume that individuals there come in contact with more infected individuals. So we would expect that null model, the mass action density dependent, and so that's what we were testing. Okay, next slide. So we set up a uh, number of experiments to look at this question, both in the lab and in the field. And the lab experiment is really the main experiment uh, that tests that. What we did is we collected egg masses and brought them back to the lab, and then we inoculated some of them. And so we had uninfected hosts, 25 per tank, and then we added either 1, 8, 15, or 22 infected tadpoles, replicated that four times and let those sit for four weeks. And then at the end of four weeks, looked at um, what the transmission rate was. Uh, we did that at 17 degrees, which is a very, uh, it's a very good temperature that we know of for chytrid fungus and for its reproduction. And then we, I also wanted to look at just one treatment here at four degrees to see what happens in an overwintering situation. And then we did a field version of this. Um, just at one lake in Yosemite, uh, here we were, this is at Mono Pass in Yosemite near, near Mono Pass, if you're familiar with that area, and it's an infected lake, we, it's known to be infected, and what we did is we went to, a, went to a drainage nearby that's uninfected and translocated um, either 5 or 15 hosts per cage of uninfected and brought them into this infected lake and then collected infected tadpoles and added either zero five or ten into the cages. So here in the zero treatment, really the only chance of them getting infected is from just the water. They're not having any direct contact with other infected individuals. Okay, next slide. All right, and what we found out from the lab experiment is that there is a positive relationship between the density of infected tadpoles and the proportion of hosts that became infected. So here on the x-axis is the number of infected, one, eight, 15, or 22. 
and this is the proportion that became infected and you can see that there is an upward trend there was no difference between the proportion of hosts that became infected at seventeen and at four degrees so i went ahead and and just showed all this data at once and now this is not saying that it's density dependent or or frequency dependent it's just saying that there is a positive relationship you can imagine a case um what we call a constant risk something that a disease that's not an infectious disease for example heart disease you know it really probably wouldn't matter your your risk probably would not matter how many other people around you um have infectious or, or i'm sorry have heart disease as well so this is basically just saying that yes chytrid fungus is acting like an infectious disease um, the number of infected individuals around it makes around an individual makes a difference okay next slide Okay, and the results of the field experiment, I, um, it was just one lake, but it actually gave us quite a bit of information. We found there was spatial variability in transmission even within one lake in, um, in Yosemite. So the effect, of the effect of infected tadpole density in a cage varied by the side of the lake. We had done our um, one replicate on this side of the lake and one over here. And it just so turned out um, that there are a lot more infected tadpoles just hanging around on the north side of the lake than there were on the south side. There were usually, you know, between five and seven hundred over here, where on this side there are approximately three times fewer. And most of those tadpoles, whenever I checked, were infected, and at least based on mouthparts and a number of um, molecular techniques. So here you can see on the north side, even in the zero cage, there was high um, proportion of infected individuals, and there was actually no significant relationship by, um, with density with adding either 5 or 10. And so, in this case, you know, the, the, the infection rate was so high that it didn't really matter if you added a few others in, and it didn't even matter if there were any uh, infected individuals right there in the cage, um, versus on the south side where the number of ambient tadpoles in the nearby area was much lower, there was a significant relationship. Next slide. Okay, so then we went to ask um, which transmission rate or form of the transmission function would fit our data better. So we compared the likelihoods of several different models, including the frequency dependent and the density dependent. Um, you can just kind of ignore the first paragraph that I put in small letters if you're interested interested um, in differential equations, you can look at this, but basically the experiments that we did involved relatively small numbers of individuals, and the dynamics of which are not well approximated by ordinary differential equations. So what we used was an individual based model and defined a simple binomial likelihood of the data collected at the end of the experiment, which was either the individual tadpoles were infected or uninfected. And I like to think of likely, um, likelihoods as you, you fix the data, that's what you have, and then you fit different models to see you know, which one fits better. And um, next slide. And what we did is we compared them um, through using the AIC. And what we found was the frequency dependent fit, this is the laboratory data, fit um, very well, along with the power, asymptotic, and negative binomial, all of which are models that are very similar to the frequency dependent in that their transmission rate asymptotes with higher densities of individuals. And so the AIC, the thing we have to remember about AIC, I know it's really popular uh, in our field, but it's pretty ad hoc. It's just a rule of thumb. It's not a statistical test. So we are going to take this data further and do some statistical testing with cross-validation. but. Um, at this point, within two AIC values, we consider the models pretty much indistinguishable. So the frequency dependent is doing well, but you can see here the density dependent the mass action is 3.8, which is a little bit higher, so it's above the two cutoff level. So we would say that there um, is some evidence that frequency dependent is really f uh, f characterizing the transmission better than the mass action, and the constant risk um, was much higher, so as to be expected. Uh, next slide. So you can see here, um, just plotting the data. 
um, the density dependent is up here, and then the cluster of others, including the frequency dependent. Um, like I said, this isn't a huge difference, but it is enough evidence that we'll probably be using the frequency dependent um, form in some of our predictive models. Okay, next slide. And here's the field data results. Now, we don't, th this wasn't a well-replicated study in the field. It, we just like to always compare our lab to the field to see how realistic um, you know, we think we're, we're getting from our lab data. But um, we did find here that mass action was basically indistinguishable from frequency dependent and um, as well as the other ones that asymptote. So in the field, we couldn't really distinguish between um, mass action and frequency dependent, they seem to fit equally well. Um, and then here was the constant, constant risk. Okay, next slide. And here you can see the density dependent and then um, one of the asymptotic functions, the power function. So at least in the, fi the field experiment is backing up the lab and saying that frequency dependent is um, a good fit. It wasn't able really to distinguish between, between the um, density dependent and frequency dependent. Next slide. Uh, just quickly, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but one of the questions that um, you have to consider when you're looking at density is maybe there's a different mechanism involved, uh, not just the fact that there's more, the fact that there are more individuals in the cage. Maybe it, it's not just that there are more zoospores. It could be something like there's more competition for resources in these uh, more dense tanks. So we did a quick experiment to look at that and see if this competition for resources could have been in, in fact, impacting the susceptibility to chytrid fungus. Next slide. Um, I'll just quickly tell you the results. And we found that housing the tadpoles at different densities prior to exposure affected their growth rate. Um, here you can see the number of tadpoles per tank. These are like high densities. Um, this is average body mass. But it did not in fact impact their susceptibility to chytrid fungus. Next slide. So what does this tell us about transmission in Rhonomoscosa tadpoles? Well, it does give us some evidence that the contact rate saturated at high densities of infected, but it's extremely difficult to distinguish between frequency dependence and other transmission functions that level off at high densities of infected. And I also would just add that we, we probably will be using some sort of um, uh, asymptotic function over the linear mass action. Okay, and then the other um, couple important conclusions from, from these studies are that the transmission rate was similar at summer and winter temperatures in the lab, and that is something that um, is really quite interesting to us. Uh, oftentimes we see a lot of die-offs in Rhonomoscosa when we first get there in, this, in the early summer, and so you know, we really do want to see what happens over a winter out there in the field before we want to make any conclusions. We don't want to just do experiments in the summer and say this is what's happening out there because it's not characteristic of an entire year. And this is even giving us more evidence to say that it's really important to see what's going on over winter. Of course, it's very difficult to do that in the field. Um, and susceptible tadpoles from a healthy lake became infected when moved to a diseased lake. And I think this is also a significant finding because um, there has been some question that some of the populations that are not infected out there, maybe the individual tadpoles were somehow susceptible. And th at least in this case, they, um, they were susceptible when moved. So next slide. Okay. And that, that's it. I just wanted to acknowledge our fu the funding source and all of the assistance that I've had in my PhD committee. Thank you.